Scott Morrison is probably grateful to the Australian Medical Association today because their claim yesterday that his government was inhumane for planning to airlift Australians out of China and home via a stint in quarantine on Christmas Island just reinforces the coalition's reputation for keeping our borders secure against disease as much as against people smugglers. When it comes to border protection, the more the government is attacked for being too strong, the better it is for the government. And the more it highlights the sort of risk Labor continues to pose. And today's criticism of the federal government from Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk for allegedly, she says, keeping her in the dark about coronavirus. Well, here she is. Hey, well, the tour group that arrived, they arrived into Melbourne. Only the federal government has the details on their incoming boarding card of uh, who they are, uh, where they are staying and their mobile phone contact numbers. We need to contact those people. I mean, I don't know at the moment in Queensland where people from the Hubei province currently are because the federal government has that information. Well, likewise, that blew up in her face. And that's because Health Minister Greg Hunt was able to point out that Queensland officials had been part of the Morrison government's crisis meetings on almost a daily basis. Here's the Federal Health Minister. The Tiger Air uh, flight manifest, the emails, the contact numbers and other known details were provided to Queensland at 4pm yesterday. Just to reaffirm, those details were provided to Queensland at 4pm yesterday. I would also indicate that in relation to uh, uh, daily engagement with Queensland, um, Queensland has been part of the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee meetings. Now the fact that Palaszczuk doesn't even know where her officials are in this crisis, what meetings are in, how the National Health Crisis Coordination System works, or the many other layers of detail that every leader needs to know, well, it highlights yet again why her usual dog ate my homework routine is beyond the pale. I mean, I listen to her on days like this and seriously, I can't believe she'd be put in charge of a chook raffle, let alone run a state. The very fact that the nation's health chiefs are meeting on an almost daily basis and sometimes on an almost hourly basis is a sign of just how serious the coronavirus health concern has become and could still become. The World Health Organisation, while careful not to be critical of China, and China's got them all spooked, haven't they? They have moved today to declare coronavirus a global emergency. Every day in China, thousands more are being diagnosed with the virus, which has now spread well beyond the initial epicentre of Wuhan in Hubei province. And while only around 200 people have died so far out of the 8,000 official infection rate, a plus 2% death rate in comparative terms is still 20 times that to sort of standard seasonal influenza that nonetheless kills thousands of Australians every year. And this, of course, assumes that what the Chinese are telling us is actually the truth. It's worth noting, too, that with diseases like this, there's always the chance of a more virulent strain emerging before natural resistance starts to kick in and before vaccines can be discovered, trialled and mass produced. Each week, there are 167 direct flights from China into Australia. That's more than 20 flights a day or about 10,000 people every day, every week, coming into our airports from a country that's now in virtual lockdown, at least in terms of international travel. Now, I accept halting all flights from China, it's a big call. But to my mind, public safety must come first. Of course, banning travel from China would impact our universities. I said last night, we're about here in Australia to receive the annual influx of around 160,000 Chinese tertiary students. And doubtless, should travel be banned, the university vice chancellors will scream that it's an overreaction. Even though, of course, students stuck in China could go online for their classes, at least for the time being. But the last thing we would want here as Australians are universities putting revenue before our country's safety. 
Already a number of airlines, but not including Qantas as yet, already a number of airlines have suspended flights to China, mostly because they're coming back full but going over empty, so they're no longer profitable. The difficulty, if and when flights are banned, is what people, well, expected, that people will start coming to Australia from China by third countries. But still, the first duty of government is to protect the country, and no two ministers would be more aware of this than Peter Dutton and Greg Hunt. What clearly must happen now is that we stop the planes and return Australians by special charter only. And plainly, if they do come home, they come home via a proper 14-day quarantine period, not this Mickey Mouse home quarantine lark that we all know now after the case in Melbourne is not much better than useless. Finding spare capacity to house people for quarantining isn't easy, I accept that, which is why the federal government should now be demanding that the states prepare quarantine centres to cope with the likely influx back to Australia once Christmas Island, which we expect is full. Now, I'm told there's perhaps 2,000, sorry, 20,000 expat Australians thought to be living in China, as well as tens of thousands travelling as tourists at any one time. Now, if the states refuse, it's quite likely, Peter Dutton should start to get out some of the uh, old immigration detention centres from mothballs to house an influx. And I have to say, give those slack premiers the bill. One thing's for sure we shouldn't, we must not, let short-term cash considerations or the fear of upsetting Beijing put the safety of Australians at risk, not now, not ever.